Hello, BookTube. Well, it's a bleak and barren Sunday here. Those of you who are new to the channel, that what that means is Sunday is the day of the week when there's no mail. So there's no plunk, plunk, plunk of free book packages coming to me through the slot in the front door. There's no doorbell with a mailman behind it. There's no nothing like that. Uh, but my bleak and barren Sunday today has at least had human company uh, to, to go with my dog duty. Or... Uh, I guess I should say semi-human company, because it was a bunch of hungover teenagers who mostly just rolled around periodically groaning, dude, <laughs> uh, price you pay when you, when you binge drink on Wednesday night, Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday night. Uh, but they're gone now, and uh, I uh, I wanted to do a book tag to, to while away the rest of my... Uh, my daylight hours here and then the nighttime will be entirely given over to writing because the, the the editor commissions have been flowing like the snows of yesteryear which is not exactly something i can complain about but it is eating into my time uh and the book tag that i wanted to do is the jurassic park book tag uh, and i was tagged twice i was tagged once by sue at sue's book nook and once by richard bruna uh and uh rather than combine my answers i am doing two i'm I'm doing a fiction version and a non-fiction version. <laughs> uh, and this is the fiction edition of the Jurassic Park book tag. Uh, and the first question is, what is your favorite dinosaur? I, my answer is the same in both versions, the plesiosaur. Uh, because it straddles a line between fact and fiction, between non-fiction and fiction. Because it's the leading theory, if you want to use that word, for, for uh, the mysterious creature that lives in Loch Ness. Uh, the mysterious creature that lives in Loch Ness is, uh, is actually... Uh, not there at all. <laughs> Since, of course, you if you had, if a plesiosaur were living in Loch Ness, it couldn't be alone, now could it? <laughs> you would need a breeding population, and you would need a breeding population of sufficient size and genetic diversity to keep that population going in isolation from the rest of the world for millions of years. <laughs> Loch Ness could be as big as Puget Sound, still wouldn't be big enough, <laughs> and to feed them, and, and never a... a, a Photograph and no bones, no carcasses, no nothing, <laughs> nothing hit by a boat. No, <laughs> but still, it's fun to think about. And when you think about Loch Ness now, you can't help but think about the plesiosaur because it, the, uh, it as an explanation for the monster in the lake has been around for a hundred years, and it's the first thing anybody goes to when they talk about it. Uh, uh, question number two: Alan Grant, a character who would survive Jurassic Park, and. Uh, I've been reading quite a bit lately about the Mongol hordes invading uh, Central Asia. <laughs> and so in the breaks between that, I have been giving myself little breaks here and there. And the, my breaks have taken the form of reading graphic novels of my beloved Legion of Superheroes. <laughs> and so my answer to this question, although Alan Grant is the hero of Jurassic Park, is a villain, Nemesis Kid, uh, whose superpower, which he appears to have given himself, uh, is the ability to instantaneously adapt his body to match any one opponent, no matter who it is. He punches punches out Superboy famously when he's trying out for the Legion of Superheroes. Uh, and I figure an adaptable cuss like that, if he weren't dead, he's he in the Legion of Superheroes continuity, at least the last time I checked, he was dead. Uh, but I put him in Jurassic Park and I'd be willing to bet that he would find a way to adapt to anything that came his way. Uh, Question number three, Ellie Sattler, a character willing to risk their life for others. I'm afraid I won't do this for the whole tag, but I'm afraid I'm going to stick with the Legion of Superheroes just for now and pick Pharaoh Lad, an Earth-born mutant with the ability to transform his body into super hard iron. Who, In a famous story from, oh my God, 50 years ago, uh, sacrifices his life to destroy a monster called a Sun Eater. None of the rest of the Legion of Superheroes has much of a chance at the moment that it's crucial to do it. So he takes the bomb that will kill the thing and flies it into the creature, even though he knows he won't survive. Uh, and it was, it was, uh, that doesn't sound like anything now, especially to you comics fans, because you're all 18. But that was genuinely shocking to have a comic book character who had been in many issues decide to sacrifice his life and then to have it happen. It was, it was a teenager who wrote that story, and he wrote it specifically to give these comic books that he was reading every month some punch, some emotional punch, 
and boy, did it work. <laughs> um, after that, after the death of Pharaoh Lad, everything was up for grabs. Nobody was safe, <laughs> especially not in the Legion. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> uh, question number four, Ian Malcolm, uh, a book where you can predict the ending. And of course, when it comes to predicting the ending, I don't view that as a bad thing at all. I don't need a book to surprise me. And so the genre that I love most of all for that is romance novels, because in a romance novel, you know roughly what the ending is going to be, except for the current iterations of uh, modern, you know, extremely contemporary romances or, or modern contemporary supernatural romances, which I don't tend to read. And with them, things are more are more unpredictable. You could have a, a, a bad ending, a sad ending, a tragic ending. I'm talking about Regency romances, really. The most predictable kind of romance novel. And not just Regency romances, but signet Regency romances from 20 years ago. The little slim things with painted covers that aren't made anymore, and that didn't have any sex. They had they had flirtation and badinage and it, and then the ending. And it was It was much like you know, the Ur text for Regency Romance is Pride and Prejudice, where everything salacious is going to happen after the last page. Uh, and I just love them. I, 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 I wish I had every re signet Regency Romance that exists. I wish I did. <laughs> I have quite a few. We'll get to that bookcase eventually, but I don't have them all, and I just gobble them down. <laughs> uh, uh, question number five, Dennis Nedry, a character who's willing to put others in danger for their own benefit. Uh, and the character that came to mind, one of you mentioned that you were reading uh, Napoleon the Great by Andy Roberts. Uh, and that made me think of Napoleon Bonaparte, who spent his entire lifetime putting others in danger for his own benefit. He did, he did almost nothing else with his life. Uh, and when I thought about him in terms of fiction, the first thing that came to mind was Anthony Burgess's great novel, Napoleon Symphony, which I don't, I don't know if it's in print anymore, but I, I urge you to go and find it. It'll be at your library. Uh, and it's it's really, really good. <laughs> uh, uh, let's see here. Question number six, Brachiosaurus, a book that took you a long time to finish. I had the same problem with the nonfiction edition. I, I read enormously fast, and I read all day long, every day. <laughs> so uh, no book, in, in, in general terms, no book takes me a long time to finish. In relative terms, you know, a, a gigantic book will take me longer to finish than a shorter book, like that new uh, literary history of China. It's 1,500 pages long, so it takes me longer to do that, but it's still not a long time in the sense of, it, it, on the spectrum of, of our re all of our reading, of, you know, 2,000 people reading. I, I suspect that how long it takes me to finish a book like that is not considered long by the rest of you. Uh, so I, I don't really have an answer to this question. Uh, uh, question number seven, T-Rex, a book you found intimidating but ended up loving. I have the same problem with the nonfiction edition. I don't find books intimidating. If I'm doing my job right, books find me intimidating. <laughs> and also, T-Rex, Cretaceous, not Jurassic. Just because we're doing a Michael Crichton book tag doesn't mean we have to mis mimic his mistakes, now does it? <laughs> huh. Question number eight, uh, Velociraptor, a book that's fast-paced. Uh, for this one, I want to pick God's Pocket by Pete Dexter, a very overlooked American author, great American author, and the, the author of one of the great novels of the second half of the 20th century, Paris Trout. Uh, his novel, God's Pocket, is, uh, is very good. It, it's, it's just as intelligent as Paris Trout or anything else this author wrote, but it's much more violent. <laughs> and, and you really don't know what's coming uh, around every corner. Uh, so I, I highly recommend it if you if you find it. I'm not sure again, I'm not sure of Pete Dexter's in print status. I think I would be very very sad if I learned that Paris Trout is not in print, but it could be. Uh, and also I should point out, <laughs> uh, Velociraptor, Cretaceous, not Jurassic. Uh, uh, question number nine: Pterodactyl, a book that you flew to that flew you to another world. Uh, I know this is probably a hackneyed answer to this question, but The Way of Kings by Brandon Sanderson and its sequel. Uh, these things are doorstops. They're a thousand pages each, and they are so incredibly nerdy. It, the author has thought of everything in his world building. Even the stuff he shouldn't think about. He's thought of everything. The cellular structure of every last little plant. 
the seasonal plumage of every last little animal, germane to the plot or not, and mostly not. <laughs> and yet, it's all done. It's all presented to you with such incredibly wonky intensity that you just, you if you let yourself go, it really does consume you. And I like that. I like that very much. Uh, uh, and also, I should point out, pterodactyl, Cretaceous, not Jurassic. Uh, and question number 10, Triceratops. Uh, tag three people. And I tag uh, Elisa at Paper Bits. I tag Britta, because they must have dinosaurs in Europe. <laughs> and I tag Jennifer and insert literary pun here. Uh, and uh, I should also point out uh, that Triceratops is Cretaceous, not Jurassic. <laughs> and that's it. <laughs> I promise there are no other versions of this tag coming, so I'll, I'll let you go for now. Thank you, Mortube.